Do you want to learn to design your own parts for 3D printing? Well, you're in the right place because your journey starts here. My favorite type of 3D printing is when I have a little problem around the house and I'm able to design a custom part that I 3D print and solve the problem. Based on the comments of my last video, many other 3D printer owners are the same. But where does that leave those who want a 3D printer or already own one, but don't yet have those skills? I ran a poll last week to see if there was an audience for a tutorial series. More than 6,000 votes suggest a resounding yes. In this video, we get started by comparing the various CAD options available and set up our choice for this tutorial series. I want to start by making what should be an obvious point. When choosing CAD, the best option is the one that works best for you. If you come across someone who recommends a CAD option and tells you in absolute terms that it's the best option by far and that anyone that disagrees is an idiot, I would suggest that that person is very poor at considering the perspectives of others. Choosing CAD is very subjective, just like it is when you choose which slicer program to use. They all aim to achieve the same purpose, but the implementation and importantly the interface differs. For instance, Cura is a very popular and obviously capable slicer, but I just can't wrap my head around the accordion UI, which is why I prefer the interface of Prusa Slicer or Super Slicer. If you take the time to print back-to-back -back comparison prints with the different slicers, you'll learn that they're all quite capable. Each has some minor points of differences and pros and cons, but ultimately they can all do a good job, so you should pick the one that best clicks with you. In the comments for my poll, there's a lot of suggestions for which CAD program I should and shouldn't cover for this series of tutorials. And in my current position, it's impossible to keep everyone happy, but you should know that I have read each comment and I have considered your input. So with that in mind, let's look at some available options for 3D CAD packages. Now this list is not exhaustive, instead it's all of the CAD programs that I've used over the years. Most of these are actually quite similar in their approach and their workflow, but there are still some categories that we can distinguish. The odd one out on this list, because you can't group it with anything else to make a category, is OpenSCAD or OpenSCAD. As you can see, you can make 3D models, but I think it's best summarized by this text here, the programmer's solid 3D CAD modeler, and that's because to create the shapes, you need to write lines of code. Some people will absolutely love this, but I imagine the vast majority will find it quite difficult. So our first actual category is CAD software that's aimed at beginners. And as a former teacher, these are all programs that I've taught to younger children. SketchUp, I previously invested a lot of time in, finding the best plugins to extend its capabilities and creating a series of tutorials for my students to use. In terms of 3D printing, it was very hard to get SketchUp to output geometry that was manifold or better known as watertight. In simple terms, that meant that the STLs that you exported for 3D printing were generally full of errors. 123D Design from Autodesk was an option that improved on this greatly. It was quite accessible for students, completely free, but ultimately stopped being supported by Autodesk, which means it's not really a viable option. So in my opinion of these beginner options, Tinkercad is by far the best. It works like Lego by dragging and dropping different blocks. You can then rotate them or set their dimensions, and you can group together various shapes to combine them, including setting some shapes as a whole, which means I will subtract from the rest of the shapes. Tinkercad is simple enough to learn from a single video, and I have such a video linked below in the description but its initial ease of use can end up being a barrier to creating more advanced geometry later on. Let's consider we have a cube and we want to round the edges, what's known as a fillet. In Tinkercad, this is actually very hard. You can get there, but it's a lot less straightforward than the more advanced CAD programs that we're going to focus on. And that leaves us with our final category, which is parametric 3D solid modelers. Let's have a look at what they have in common. The first thing to understand is that these programs are solid modelers. That means the models are watertight and suitable for 3D printing. If we compare that to a surface or mesh modeler, we can see that it's possible to actually delete some of the surfaces and that ruins the integrity of the model, particularly for 3D printing. The next part of the terminology is parametric, but that just means that the models are derived from parameters. All of the parameters or steps that we've taken to create the model will be listed down the side of the interface, or in the case of Fusion 360, along the bottom. 
For instance, to make this simple 3D cube, there are three steps. The first is a dimension 2D sketch. We then make it 3D by extruding it up a certain height. And then finally, we apply a fillet to make the corners round. The major advantage of using a parametric modeler is that we can change these parameters whenever we like. For instance, I'm going to make this cube only 50 instead of 100. And after we save our change, we can see our 3D model is rebuilt with the new parameters. And this approach makes our models infinitely editable. For complicated models, we can end up with a very long list of steps used to create them. But with a parametric modeler, at any point we can go back to any of these steps and edit the dimensions to make adjustments. Save the change and everything will rebuild with the new parameter. And this is why I think parametric solid 3D modelers are best for 3D printing. We tend to make iterations that hone in on the perfect fit, so this type of CAD lets us easily update the design. We've narrowed down to one category, but which one will we choose for this series? I've used each of these, some more than others, and the CAD package I actually learnt on at university was SolidWorks. For professional use, it's ludicrously expensive, but occasionally there are offers for hobbyists to use the program free of charge, but this is not guaranteed, so we'll move on. Autodesk Inventor is another option I've used quite a bit, previously creating tutorials for F1 in schools. It's free for education, but not intended for free hobbyist use. A free option that seemed to be divisive is FreeCAD. It's the only option here that is 100% free, and not only that, it's actually open source as well. However, for every person praising FreeCAD, there was another claiming it was limited, buggy, or had a poor interface. And previously when I tested it, it didn't quite have what I needed. On this list, by far the most popular is Autodesk Fusion 360. And I think the biggest selling point is the different environments that you can switch to for different types of work. That includes a nice set of cam tools for CNC routing and milling, but since we're focusing on 3D printing, they're not as attractive here. An issue that I've seen discussed by those that use it for personal use is the cut down of the free features available for such an account. Perhaps the most relevant is the limit to having 10 active documents, meaning for a frequent user, you have to manage your projects between active and inactive states to keep within the limit. So out of these available options, for this tutorial series, what we're actually choosing is Onshape. The poll comments were also favourable to Onshape, and it's the one that I'm most familiar with too. It's impossible for everyone to be happy with this decision, but Onshape does have a range of attractive features that I think will appeal to most people, so let's go through some. First and foremost is accessibility, with Onshape running completely out of your browser. This means once you've made an account, you can access all of your models from any computer just by logging in. It doesn't matter if you're on Windows, Mac, Linux, or anything else. To add to that, there's also apps available for Android and iOS. And surprisingly, these are fully featured. On a tablet with a bigger screen, it's feasible to actually create files and edit, with all of the regular tools being present, but modified to work without right-click. However, on a phone is where I found this most useful. If I'm out buying hardware for a project, I can inspect the model and take measurements to make sure I get the right parts. Of course, this cloud-based accessibility requires a stable internet connection. And if you don't have that, this will be an obvious deal breaker for you. Next up, improvements. And since you're logging into a website, updates to the software are automatic. You'll just see a little notification in the top right telling you that there's new features and you can click to see the list if you're interested. Next up, stability and redundancy. And I've been using Onshape for more than five years now and I've never experienced a single crash. This compares very favorably to other CAD programs. And in terms of redundancy, every single change that you make is automatically saved. This includes if you're halfway through a sketch and lose internet connection, what you had so far will be waiting for you when you're back online. There's also a versioning system and every single change you've ever made to your document is automatically saved. So even if you make a huge error, it's possible to go back in time and restore to a previously good state. Next up, collaboration and organization. The interface is very much like Google Drive. All of your projects will be listed and you can make folders if you like to organize them, as well as assigning labels. And just like Google Docs, you can share your projects with other people to collaborate. This part in grey was designed by my best friend David and he shared it with me to check before he commenced 3D printing. If we like, we can both work on it at the exact same time, just like with Google Docs. And when a project is finished and it comes time to publish it, 
you can use the share feature to your advantage. We can set the document so anyone with the link can view as well as export individual parts in a format of their choice. And pasting this into a file sharing site means you don't need to export all of your parts in step format. So quality of life is a strong attraction and that extends into the help and support. For any particular tool, if we hover the mouse over long enough, we'll get a short summary. And from within that tool, there'll be a question mark that opens a link to a dedicated help page. We can click our platform and find step-by-step -step instructions. And almost always there's a video example that's concise and shows the tool in action. So what about the actual CAD? The first thing to know is that Onshape was founded by a team that in part contains CEOs from SolidWorks. So the foundation is credible. So far, I've yet to start a project where I felt limited by Onshape. It's quick and easy for simple projects, exporting beautiful SDLs for 3D printing. And if you're using it for laser cutting, you can right click on any surface and export as a DXF. I've also been able to successfully complete complex engineering projects. These include the creation and dimensioning of complex geometry and creating assemblies with mates that simulate gears and moving parts to check for clearance. And if you do find a feature missing, there's a good chance someone in the community has created it with what's called feature script. Think of these like plugins to add additional functionality. This particular project used feature script to be able to add NACA aerofoil profiles. This one I used to create spur gears. And this handy feature script models extruded aluminium profiles based off just a straight line. To further extend our functionality, we have the App Store. Some of these are free and some of them are paid and they add functionality such as rendering and simulation to Onshape. Examples of apps I've covered before include SimScale, which I used for computational fluid dynamics, Cadacio, which I've used to make rendered animations to explain concepts and processes on the channel, and Kirimoto, which offers a simplified cam environment for CNC milling, 3D printing, as well as laser cutting. Sounds good, so what's the catch? Why is it free? Not many things in life are actually free, so what's the catch here? For all of the pay software we've looked at, they generally have a free version for students with the hope of building brand loyalty and converting to a professional account when they're older. And for software like Fusion 360, the deal is similar, where the user can use most of the software, but limitations are in place to make them consider paying for a fuller version. With Onshape, our free version comes with one caveat, and that it only allows us to create public data. Beyond that, there's no limitations in terms of functionality. So what does public data actually mean? If we go to the public tab, we'll see a random selection of what other people are working on. However, most of these will be shown here because the author has linked to them in a forum or somewhere else. If someone malicious was trying to find your project to rip it off, they would firstly need to know that it exists and then search for it from the search bar. So if you care about keeping your projects anonymous, simply give them a title that's not particularly descriptive. It's worth noting too that if someone does find your public documents, it will be view only. And they can make a copy to edit themselves, but they can never edit your actual model. Nothing here is as free as FreeCAD, but personally this compromise with Onshape doesn't really concern me. With all of that out of the way, let's get started. Let's quickly cover how to make our free Onshape account. They want you to pay money, so the right place to click isn't necessarily that obvious. But we're going to start by coming to request a trial. We'll ignore the professional dialogue and come down to hobbyist and click get free on shape for makers. We fill out the form with our details. A confirmation email will be sent to us, which we click to finish creating our account. When you first log in, you'll have this interface, except you won't have any projects listed. And the one thing you probably want to do before you get designing is to come up to your username and then go to my account. We have superficial things like changing usernames and profile pictures. And we also have a section where we can turn off notifications. But by far the most useful is when we come to preferences. Here we can set our language, but vitally the type of units we want, whether we're using millimeters for metric or something imperial. Beyond this, most of the default settings will be fine, but we do have extra options for how the mouse works, as well as what shortcuts appear on the toolbars. That's it, super easy to get started. And in the next episode, we'll design our first part and then build in complexity from there, learning more about how to model complex objects until we hopefully achieve some sort of mastery. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D modeling.
G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.